Welcome everyone, my name is Kevin McCarthy. I'm the director of production for Videolink. Uh, we're a full service video production company with a heavy focus on live streaming and we're based out of Boston. Uh, and for those who, who came here with the expectation that we'd be talking heavily about pajamas here in the wrong conference, it's probably at Streaming Media West, but not this one. Um, so before we, uh, we get into it, I will ask for questions, but I'm not gonna wait till the very end. If you have a question, just raise your hand. If uh, there's a certain part of the discussion or topic you wanna throw a question out, just raise your hand, we'll, we'll get to you when we can. So before we get into introductions and uh, some bios and overviews of our panelists, um, I wanna talk a little bit about the definition of what this topic is. So remote production or uh, re remote production involving video over IP, some may call it at-home production or, or Remy production. I think everyone, depending upon uh, the specific space that you are you are in in the industry may have a different bit of a, a definition of what that is. So, if I can have uh, our panelists here introduce yourself, who you are, in your organization, and talk a little bit about what your definition is of this topic and how it fits within your organization. I think I think I've just gone live. I think it's a good sign. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Adams. I'm from a company called Brand Live up in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we create live events, town halls, sales enablement, retail training events for corporates. Uh, in addition to the production services that we do, we have an interactive platform that allows people to, to post comments and interact, download stuff during the event. And uh, In addition to large corporations like Nike and Levi's, we work with a lot of small companies as well who pretty much aren't, aren't far out of their pyjamas in terms of their production requirements. So for us, our definition is could start from simple a Skype feed. Quite frankly, we know how horrifying that could be if anyone sort of tried that before in a, in a live context. It's, uh, believe it or not, not 100% reliable. Uh, phone over cellular, we do all the way up through using Wirecast, you know, one, two, three camera production. Um, but yeah, it's all, all over IP, very, very simple. Uh, typically, we have uh, a centralized studio and then guests coming in, you know, special guests around, you know, presenting on a, a product or whatever. Uh, for that, so very, very simple. Nothing like the broadcast type quality uh, that you know some of the other panelists might be used to. So yeah, quite, quite streamlined. John. Good morning, guys. I'm from a company called Teradek. Uh, we are we are the manufacturers of the gadgets that a lot of these companies that provide streaming services use. Um, we make devices that are both used to take the feed from the camera and send it to the switcher wirelessly because uh, in a lot of situations you cannot run a wire um, and we take the feed from the switcher to uh, encode that feed and then uh, stream that to uh, an unlimited number of CDNs whether that be a private CDN that you may use mm -hmm. or whether that be Facebook or YouTube um, you know, we, we provide, we've provided uh, gear from uh, everyone from the President, uh, President Trump uses our gear, President Obama uses our gear, to the Pope, to a church, to a high school. We have products that range from free that are available on the phone up to, you know, eight, nine thousand dollars, you know, that able, enable you to aggregate multiple cell connections um, and stream at, uh, you know, HEVC kind of qualities, 1080p. Uh, qualities. Megan. I'm Megan Wagner. I work for a company called Vimond. We're based out of Bergen, Norway, um, have a global presence. Uh, we pretty much manage and distribute OTT services using our online video platform. Um, for services in terms of remote production, I would say our um, editing suite is where is kind of our sweet spot there. What we do for our editing is we bring in live and VOD feeds, and then we can edit, manipulate metadata, um, add graphics, you know, pretty much whatever you need to do all in the browser. And then we can publish it to social, uh, to a content management system, or wherever it needs to go. So we're doing that for digital and for broadcast. Great, thank you. Uh, so a 30,000 foot question here to start things off. Why do we need this? Why do we need a technology such as this? What's driving it? Is it uh, advancements in technologies that's enabling us to create a solution like this? Or it's a, is it clients or an audience that says, no, we want something different that's cost effective to drive it? So can you speak a little bit about 
what, why is this a solution that works for you, for your organization, or overall in this industry? Why is this needed? And is it beneficial? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? Who wants to take it? Yeah, I'll start. I mean, I, mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, if you look at Sunday Night Football, right, which is a production uh, picked up by, you know, one of the major TV providers, they typically roll, roll in a, a 25 foot truck trailer. Uh, you know, 15 to 25 people operate that trailer. They, you know, it's, it's a multi-million dollar operation. Um, that's how it was done a few years ago, and that was the only option. The change in, the change, or what, what has happened is um, that as equipment has got less expensive and as IP has become more reliable, it has meant that we can utilize um, lower cost equipment to be able to do a similar kind of production, but without driving a truck out there or, out, or without rolling as many people out there. It's, 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 become, it's become important to do because um, of the industries or, or the, the streaming platforms that we're now streaming to, you know, these social platforms, these, these very niche-based platforms, we're not going out to millions of people. We may only be going out to, you know, in a corporate environment, a few hundred, few hundred people. Yeah. So it's got to be cost-effective for the, for the for the people that we're trying to um, pitch our gear to, 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 to the audience. Um, you know, the wonderful thing is, is that, um, you know, with a company like yours, we are, we are able to go uh, and put together a, a solution for a cost that, you know, is at a budget that these companies that can, can afford to do. Um, and give them a production value that, you know, frankly, 10 years, 15 years ago w was not possible. So we ask ourselves, what's the next step? I mean, we're still rolling, we're still rolling gear into facilities. You know, you're still turning up with a video switcher. You're still turning up with, with cameras. You know, what is going to be the next step? And, and, and I think a lot of people are considering the Remy or the remote style production as an option. Um, because it's, it's a natural extension of, of moving things into the cloud um, and not having to drive people out to that location. It, it, it just seems, you know, an easier way to do things, right? right. Yeah, for sure. You know, I, I think that's exactly right. So our, our customers are corporates. Their product isn't video, like, you know, broadcasters. Their product is whatever else their product is, like jeans or sneakers or whatever. But Every company is still a video company, they need a video strategy, so instead of the truck, we can come up with a, with a backpack, quite frankly, with everything we need to do the remote production. Uh, so we're getting pulled into it because, because of the costs getting cheaper, because of IP getting better, and quite frankly, because everyone has figured out that they need to have a video strategy and they don't want to have to fly everyone into a studio or you know, they, the remote multiple sources is, is very important to them. Yeah, I would say that something that's driven us in terms of technology, um, you know, as a technology provider, from the beginning, we created a product that was based in the cloud. So we weren't really starting from on-site and then moving to remote. We were able to have access, and our clients are able to have access remotely from the day that we started creating the product. And we do that, I think it enables a virtual workforce. So, you know, content providers, um, people that they're they can make their core focus back on the content and the technology is kind of a service for them. They're not having to work about setting up infrastructure. Um, they're not having to manage anything themselves. And so we really try to take that away and so that folks can excel in their core competency, which is creating content and reaching the people that they want. Great. So let's talk a little bit about quality. So John, you mentioned you know, a sports, um, um, idea of having a production truck and large amount of labor and they're all on site. So within that solution, you have a large redundancy built in, you have many people operate very specific roles. So this type of solution, you're, you're, you're saving costs on not only the equipment side, but, but, but the labor side. Do you lose anything in, uh, not, not I want to say streaming quality, but quality meaning overall production solution quality? Are you losing something as far as not having enough eyes on your overall production or not having enough of the, the, the meteor equipment? I mean, I, I think that we have to be realists, right? I, I still don't think that we're at a time where 
you know, if I wanted to do something that was very important, I, I would want to make sure that I had a crew, right? But I think that within a year to two years, remote production will be as reliable as on-site production. Um, you know, there's a couple of technologies that are coming along that we hope will uh, allow us to um, guarantee that the feeds that we're going to get from a particular location will get to where we need them to get. One of the challenges that we have today is connectivity, right? We turn up at a, a facility like this and we say to ourselves, okay, I want to deploy a couple of cameras, put a switcher in, how am I going to get out of here? You cannot I mean, that is our biggest Achilles heel, um, and I think we're all hoping um, that 5G, I mean, that, that, that seems to be uh, something that, that's going to be rolled out in the US. Uh, I don't know how it is in, in Europe, but um, that, that should get us uh, more bandwidth into the cloud. Um, I think that uh, the switches that we have it, and the graphic engines that we have in the cloud at the moment are still rudimentary. Um, they've got some uh, development um, and uh, you know reliability and development. Development really uh, still needs to, to be uh, proven to be um, something that um, if someone is paying you to to provide a product, you have you have to guarantee that product. Yeah. I think I think 24 months are a reasonable time frame for, for things to get better. I, I don't think the impact of 5G, for example, I think is is not going to be felt for a little while. I still can't get a a good signal in my hotel room in New York just for voice calls, quite frankly. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think in terms of whether anything's being lost, I mean, you know, most of our corporate partners haven't had anything to compare it to, and quite frankly, if it looks close enough to um, you know, the football production value, then they're happy with it. And, and my, most often it is. There's on-screen graphics. I can switch between different cameras. That's fantastic. I mean, that's, you know, when you're going from nothing or from Skype or, or Zoom, for example, you know, one of these, you know, webinar tools, then it's, it's light years ahead. So we look very good no matter what we do in, in comparison to those kind of tools. Right. And as far as the editing, I mean, live over internet is pretty reliable in the sense that we're bringing in, um, you know, very low bandwidth. We're editing on proxy files, and then we start transcoding as soon as it comes in. So you're able to immediately, um, you know, manipulate the feed and start editing and play it out. Uh, it is important, though, to have redundancy, and we can do that in different clouds. We can have uh, several, several different. Um, you know, instances in the same region and different regions globally. And then all of that doesn't make a lot of sense unless you have an automatic failover. So once that happens, then as a service, you've got to be able to quickly switch and not interrupt that live feed. Great. Yeah, we, we've seen great reliability in the cloud with, with, with using services from, from AWS. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the security is, is very secure. Yep. Um, you know, they have a lot of inherent redundancy built into their servers. So we, we utilize their worldwide deployment of pop sites to, to, to be able to automatically route video. If I see lo, lo, uh, drop packets um, you know, in a particular area, I can then route them through someone else, somewhere else. And the internet, the, the, you know, the internet is, is, is an interesting animal. It, it, it's not, everyone assumes that everything is good and safe in the internet. And you know, I'll give you an example. I was doing a stream from New York to LA, uh, going through a, a, a pop site in um, Chicago a couple of weeks ago. And I'm, I'm seeing that the bit rate is going up to the cloud. Uh, I can see that uh, we're not dropping any packets. And yet, we were looking at the decoder on the other, uh, in, the, in, in um, the West Coast, and it, and it looked terrible. We were dropping a lot of packets. Um, you know, at that point, you start to think, "Oh, there's a problem with the equipment." Until someone says, "Well, let's uh, let's route it via a, a server in Brazil." So we were going down south, up to, from Brazil up to the west coast, and it looked perfect. Um, you know, these are the kinds of things that you you are dealing with on a daily basis with IP, and and you have to be able to be resilient enough in, in, and to understand enough to be able to work around those kinds of problems. And it's a very different problem from 
from uh, you know running a cable on a floor. It's a, it's a very different skill set, um, and uh, I, I think that there's uh, still uh, still still a uh, people needed that understand that kind of. Uh, Technology, um, you know, it's it's not really a, a videographer. Or it, it's it's a different skill set completely. Yeah, it's a network engineer. Yeah. Yes. So, I feel that within this industry now, it's we're in a transitional industry that we're trying to figure what's a proper solution, what's the best solution uh, for your at-home production needs. But as technology increases with five G or new production um, te uh, uh, technology solutions, do you feel that there will be an industry standard? Just like traditional broadcast production, there's traditional uh, industry standards of how to do it. Do you think there will be an industry standard for uh, video over IP remote solutions? And if so, what do you think that would be? Do you mean like a, a technical standard or a yeah. hardware and software? Both. It's, you know, I think uh, it's going to be cost driven. And so I, I think the answer is no in terms of hardware and software solutions. I really think you know you have to, you, you could spend on your remote production twenty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars, or you could spend you know five thousand, ten thousand. It really depends on on what the budget is. And within that price point, there's all kinds of solutions. There's John solutions and um, you know things that are cloud based, things that are hardware based. So so I think it's unlikely. Maybe at the top end, you know, broadcasting and, and you know all the dollars behind that drove those kind of standards. So maybe maybe at the the upper end of the production value scale. I mean, standards mean something slightly different for us. I mean, we 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 em embrace the video compression standards that are out there. We use both H.264, which is the protocol that is used to stream to virtually 100% of the CDNs out there, you know, Facebook or YouTube, right? They, they all accept H.264, which is a standard. Um, but if we want to talk about, you know, what will be in the future and, and, and will other standards be adopted, um, HEVC is a new standard that is being adopted. Um, it's very, very good at very, very low, low bit rate encoding. It's very, very efficient. Um, that's great when you're challenged by your first mile bit rate, right? Because you've got to get that feed out. Um, and that would be a great standard to use in remote production because um, you're able to take in multiple feeds at a low bit rate and then switch those, but still retain a very high quality. So I, 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 you know, we, we we look at the standards and, and you know, we'll try and always adopt uh, the, the best standard, uh, you, know, you know, for for video compression, which is the world that we play in. And I think for us, it's important to to be as agnostic as we can. I think you know, with files, we're agnostic. Um, we're browser based, but we you know we bring in like the typical formats. We can bring in HLS and. It's important for us to be able to have an open ecosystem. I think as soon as we start to close off and say we can only do certain things, that's when we get into trouble. Mm. Um, because we're finding that you know technologies are going to continue to change, and you're going to have people that want to, you know, enable some sort of capability that we don't want to necessarily build ourselves. And so we have to make it super easy for either the end customer or a third party to be able to plug into that. So you mentioned easy, and I think that's a, an important term to state when. We're thinking about this type of solution. So um, kind of a, a two-part <coughs> question here is um, I know some of you are involved with cloud-based solutions. So uh, on my side, most of our uh, video over IP solutions are taking remote locations to bring it back to a central control room. But there are cloud-based switcher production solutions out there. And so what are those? How are they working in this field? And and the next part of that is it's is training. How easy are they to use? Is it something to easily adapt for people who don't have much of a production or or streaming background? Yeah, I mean, so we we certainly don't have a, a cloud-based solution yet. It's something we we have on the roadmap. But in terms of downloadable tools, we have something that's even simpler than Wirecast to use that we have for our you know pajama-based production folks. But uh, in terms of training, I mean, 
there's no getting around it. These are technical tools that have to be used, whether it's cloud-based, whether it's hardware, whether it's software. You have to train people properly on how to use it. That's why there's a crew, and, and that's the biggest challenge we face, quite frankly, when we're taking these amateur non-video people and trying to turn them into video production people. Eventually, you know, we can't produce every event for them, so they have to be trained. Uh, and when your job is you know, a marketing person or some other function within the business, you've got to learn how to be a video person. It's got to be as easy as possible for it. And I think that's, you know, as an industry, in this kind of DIY segment of the remote production space, I think that's really critical. Make it easy. Anyone else? So one thing that I think about when you take your production solution, you bring on a remote or outside of an on-site location. Um, what do you lose? You lose. You may lose some things technically, but do you lose that interaction with your clients? At least in, in our world, if we're on-site for remote production, we're interacting with the client, we're interacting with the talent. Uh, in this type of solution, you're remote. You may not be having that in-person interaction. Is there is there something lost there, or I, how do you think that affects? Yeah, I, I think that you have to be smart and in deciding when and where to use a Remy production, right? If interacting with your talent, your CEO, your customer is important, then you need to turn up, right? That's part of the service that you give. Um, where Remy productions seem to be popular in the world that I live in is, is doing sports, where there's no interaction, right? Um, uh, you know that that seems to be the the sweet spot of the moment. You know, you, so so that's. You, I don't think it's a one size fits all. You, you can't just. Uh, at least not at this stage. Do you, do you think it fits in other markets? And we're talking sports. Sports is heavily using this type of model. But do you think it fits in a corporate world or a medical world or or educational world where you're. Corporate world, maybe it's it's a you know a panel discussion in someone's headquarters, but your production team isn't there. It's handling it remotely. Is that is that something that this this solution fits in? Is yeah. it something other than sports? Yeah, I mean, so just just because the production's remote doesn't mean you you might not necessarily not send crew there. I mean, you can still have crew there, and right. and you know the talent we're dealing with is the CEOs, is the panel, is the the product manager or whatever. So very new to it all. So. Quite frankly, we have to be there for the first five or six productions to make sure it goes smoothly. And then you can leave it to themselves. Then you can go back to the, the central studio and manage it from there. But initially, um, you know, really part of every deployment, every project we do is, has some on-site element to it. And I've got a little bit of a different perspective just from what we provide. Um, you know, we're able to do events that are one-time events and the idea is for it to be no IT department so like what do you lose an IT department mm. and that's a positive for the client at that point because they just want to roll up you know um, set up log on and then be able to do an event production so uh, we're working on one in June that is an award show for a music based award show that's national and they're just going to be able to do a red carpet and you know they're bringing us a stream it's going through a cloud encoder and then they're going to be able to do everything browser-based from wherever they are. They don't have to be at you know, a studio. They don't have to be at the actual location where things are being filmed. Somebody can be at their house actually working on it and then shooting it out um, to publish. But, the, but that, that's, uh, that's an environment that fits very well for mm -hmm. remote, right? Yeah. Because you're very standoff. You know, mm -hmm. You're standing back viewing something. I think when you're doing these more personal um, Productions, I, I, I can see that there's, there's actually um, definitely the right place to use it and definitely the, yep. the wrong place to use it. Yep. And I think that that's going to come through experience um, w with the experience of, of rolling out and doing these productions. Yep. How many guys here are doing productions? All right. Any, anyone doing remote production? Anyone doing their productions in pajamas? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't wear pajamas today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Next year we'll have to do okay. that. Okay. If we have any questions, please raise your hand. Yeah. We'd we'll yeah. like to hear them. Is anyone using a cloud um, production service uh, where they're switching in the cloud, adding graphics in the cloud? <clears throat> no? Okay. Yeah. Well, so I mean, we've talked before. Yes. 
um, and you know, we use their devices. And by the way, we've been able to train a lot of people who are not technical. So oh, fantastic. For you. Um, but you know, we go to conferences that are one-off events. So I don't know how we would ever get away from actually. I mean, we only send two of us, but you know, they do have IT people there that have the network. They do have the broadcasters who are handling the cameras and all of that. And right. So I'm not quite sure how you get away from sending somebody. I, 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 I absolutely agree that when you're turning up at a place that you've never been to before, you have to go and do it once yeah. or twice. Yeah, yeah. But if you were going back to that same location every week, there would come a point where you would be able to not have to turn up. You'd send devices, you'd tell them to plug them in, the feeds would pop up in the cloud, and all we have to do is add a switching engine, a cloud-based switcher, where you can add graphics and different languages, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and do that all in the cloud. So you'd still have to obviously have people on the ground who were trained in at least plugging I, in. That's going to be correct. But they may be IT guys, they may not be production guys. Right. Right? Yeah, I think, I think if it's a one-off production, you're, you're still doing on-site, you're, you're building your show on-site and you're tearing it in afterwards. But there's repetitive, if they're doing it over and over again, the same type of show, corporations do quarterly meetings or do uh, you know, uh, biannual um, town hall meetings. Weekly town hall. Right. That might be something where you develop more of a permanent, um, a, a permanent solution for them. And what usually comes into play with corporations is that they're not a production company. They're a, whatever their business is mm -hmm. and they don't want to handle the labor, the cost for labor of hiring production people. They want something where you provide a force, but we don't want you coming in, loading in the day before, doing the show, and then loading out the next day. Do something kind of semi-permanent. You kind of have a setup here, and either you send your folks, or maybe you could do it uh, remotely. Maybe you can have your people control everything remotely from a remote location. Mm, that's exactly what we do yeah. for, for Levi, for example. Levi Strauss and Company have, I think, pretty much a daily live event to their stores around the world, talking about products, town halls, quarterly results, and that kind of stuff. So on site, we have three cameras, which are every, every, every production is typically you know, a PowerPoint, some pre-recorded video, and then switching between the three cameras on site. We have somewhere there to operate that every time, because they're in the jeans business. They're not in the video right. production business. Yeah. You know, we think about these types of solutions uh, all the time, we're a production company trying to think what's the best way to support our clients. And the first thing that comes up when we think about what's the next way to, to solve a solution like this is how much is it going to cost us? But I think that the deeper question is how long is it going to last? I mean, back in the day, you outfit your production facility and you're good for 10 years. Now it's mm. maybe a couple of years. Um, so I guess a question for, for the panel here is, how are you, what efforts are you putting into your investment on your, your infrastructure and how far in advance are you talking or thinking about the next step or as technology advances, as 5G comes into play, what's the next step? Yeah, I think, you know, when we're telling our customers to outfit their offices with equipment, I mean, we could tell them to get a four or $5,000 equipment package, some lav mics and a couple of cameras and, and that stuff and that's it and, and that'll last as long as it lasts. I mean that probably will last them three to five years. We, we wouldn't mean, you know, typically they don't spend in their first go round, they don't spend more than 20,000 bucks, $10,000 but then, you know, as they become more sophisticated and video becomes more central then they could easily spend 100, 200,000 on, on fitting out a studio. Uh, and then, you know, how long does that asset last for? You know, possibly five months I think is, is the kind of lifespan that you give something like that now. Right. Sorry, five years. Five years, five months. Five, five months was great. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. It would be great I if you were selling that, that equipment idea. and you had a, a five-month replacement cycle. Yeah. That would be amazing. Hey, I, 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 I mean, on, on that vein, I, you know, I don't know how many people are here are, are aware of uh, the, the new change in Facebook, right? If you want to stream to Facebook now, you've got to use RTMPS. Now, there are encoders that we sold a year ago that didn't do, doesn't do RTMPS, you need a, a lot, <laughs> right, so, you know, I've even got someone that bought encoders, you know, three months ago, yeah. 
Now they didn't tell me they were doing Facebook Live, but you know, and Facebook Live just announced a change. So, you know, we're we're in a world now where the equipment is disposable almost. Mm -hmm. But then the the cost, you know, you're looking at a six hundred dollar encoder. You know, should that be? Disposable. I mean, you, your phone costs more than that. Mm. You know. And yes. I would say I hope that Teradek Core can convert that for me, right? It does. Okay, that's good. <laughs> that's, that's what's great about solutions in the cloud. Yes. That, that's hardware, true. Yeah. And that's true. Opt in for a solution in the cloud. It can send it. Right. Right. There you go. That, that's true. We 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 can be far more agile with the cloud. Right. <laughs> Suddenly, you know, Facebook decides. We're only going to accept 4K. Mm. Okay. <laughs> well, you never know, right? Then, yeah. I, I, I think that I think that CDNs might start to differentiate themselves, some based on quality, right? I mean, okay, I'm going to be the 4K only CDN, and boom, I'm only going to receive 4K. So, for me to flip that in the cloud is is no big deal. I have transcoders in the cloud. I can transcode something from or up convert it from from a you know 1080p feed to 4k very simply that 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 is there at the moment and i think that that's why we want to move towards the cloud right i i you know we're we're in we're in the throes of rolling you know, you know within a month we'll be rolling out a, a a real switcher in the cloud where you'll have graphics and you'll have lower thirds and you'll be able to switch and yes it will be um, basic, but I think it's you know one small step for mankind, one giant step for Teradek as a, as moving things that we used to do on the edge into the cloud, and um, you know trying to do it at, at, at a, also as as a pay-as-you-go kind of model, mm -hmm. right? Which means that you guys don't have to buy any equipment. You just you know it's 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 it's. You use it for two hours on a Sunday morning to stream a, a church or a corporate event. You know, your cost to do so is you know, two, three bucks an hour. That's exactly how we look at it. Um, in terms of cloud-based you know, business models, you have a software as a, a solution and you use what you use and you pay what you use. You know, a fraction of a penny you know, per minute for, for ingest, for rendering, um, that type of thing. And so there's no contract, there's no commit. That's why you can do events. That's why you can do things that are one-offs. But then you can also enable people you know, all over the globe to access the same story. And you know, it's not a per seat or a per license fee. It's just what you're using. Um, so we found that to be very effective. And of course, you can tier models. You can do whatever you need to to make the business model work. Uh, but it makes it a lot more granular. And it's all OPEX. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, I and mean, it's interesting to look at the, you know, how this industry has grown, right? I mean, you know, you're now able to do things on the fly. You're able to, I mean, because of the cloud, we've been able to expand what we do. Uh, you know, because of IP, we're able to um, stream something from here to the cloud, right? You know, many years ago, it would, the, the cost to do so would have just been prohibitive. You know, you know, our industry. You know, I, I, I calculate, you know, as of last week, we delivered in, in eight years 104,000 encoders. That's 104,000 people that are now streaming. You know, our industry has grown. You know, it, it's, it's definitely, uh, you wouldn't have believed it 10 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we, we've brought streaming to the mainstream, right? Yeah, sometimes I feel that the idea of how to use a technology is quicker than the actual technology. So like for several years, we've had a solution for a single camera over video, video over IP solution for broadcast live shots. But the idea was out there for a multi-camera solution. And technology is just catching up to get to that spot to provide that solution. Do, do you feel the same? Anyone? <laughs> Um, I want to talk about maintenance. So every time we buy something, we got to think about how we're going to maintain this. Um, and this is a different type of solution. This is, is this a, a broadcast maintenance type of situation or are we talking IT? This is heavy IT. How do we maintain this type of technology? 
Well, maintenance sounds like an argument for consumption-based cloud tools, quite frankly. Yeah. I mean, that's why they're going to win. That's why everything will be consumption-based cloud business model. Why, why not? It makes complete sense and negates any of the maintenance, uh, equipment redundancy. Um, but, you know, it just depends, you know, in our case, in 2019, today, I think it's probably a, a discussion with the IT team slash production team, depending on who's in charge or who owns that particular item. So is the maintenance on the user or the owner of the equipment, or is the maintenance on the manufacturer? On the, if it, especially if it's a cloud-based solution, I'm thinking it's, right. it's on that. If it's cloud-based, yeah, it's a service, right. and the technology provider, provider handles it. And you just assume, as the customer, that you're going to get you know a quality product, and yeah. you don't have to worry about software updates. You yeah. don't have hardware to worry about updates. There'll always be something to worry about, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we need our friends from B and H around. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the audience? Can I ask what would you guys like to see? What 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 would be your you know? What is it that you don't have today that you want tomorrow? Apart from the Ferrari. <laughs> but what's your biggest challenge? Is it connectivity? Is it? Is it? Like right now, when I'm trying to uh, send stuff internationally, right? And the dirty coder is a Zixi. It's not a Teradek. Right. It's uh, somebody else. So now they now I can't send them that using the Zixi or the Teradek. They've got to purchase or rent that decoder on their end. So there's so many of those types of solutions that there's not, doesn't seem to be a universal one right. for, the t for the taker. And I know a lot of the times from a TV station to a reporter in the field, but global production, we do sports, so we're trying to send a single feed to multiple takers. Right. We're trying to do a, you know, a, a streaming feed. Again, the cloud will help, right? We'll be able to flip one feed into a Zixi feeder and another feed into transport stream, and someone else wants HLS and someone else wants RTMP, and in the, the cloud allows us to do all of that. So, you know, what, what we'll continue to do is to send a very high quality single feed up to the cloud and then flip it to all these different formats. And if Zixi is one of those, we should do Zixi again. But again, that, that's the reason we, we embrace open standards, HEVC, H.264, Transport Stream, RTMP. These are all industry-based standards, right? It's, it's, you know, Zigzi is a, pri you know, it's a private, it's not a standard. And um, you know, we'll try to, uh, to accommodate as many as we can. Okay. Question? Different audio channels. Mm -hmm. Different, yeah, right, okay. Right. Yeah, as we go to conferences, taking mm. these devices, so not necessarily on prem where we have sophisticated setup and you know, everything's there, but when we go to conferences, so we've been chatting about that. Um, and the, the second thing is being able to cut uh, from live, you know, not, not having to stop the recording, but to, to actually cut as it's live, cut clips and that sort of thing without disrupting the stream. How are you handling the translation now? Is it well, right is it now one stream or are you doing multiple well, right streams? Right now we're having to um, to do the the packaging at the the source where we have to package the one audio and one video and send it out. Um, but of course that requires more bandwidth. Right. Um, yeah. But you know as we're sort of moving forward and we are looking at changing uh, you know, providers on. They would like us to split that, send the audio and the video, uh, video separately. And so we've already been talking about um, how how to maybe do that when we are in a remote situation, uh, which we are commonly covering conferences around the globe. So we'll look at that. What's your use case for um, the live editing? Edit you want to like take. Clips. Well, a lot of times our, um, we're, we're covering things that are, are that are very long sessions. Right. right. So, you know, like a, a plenary. So, um, I mean, this isn't a remote conference, but uh, if you've ever 
watched or experienced the general debate in New York, mm -hmm. right, where there's speaker after mm -hmm. speaker after speaker. So these conferences are a little bit like that. There's mm -hmm. many general debates where we have heads of state, heads of state, heads of state. Heads of state. Um, and, um, you know, we, it used to be that we would cut clip by clip. You know, sometimes now we, uh, you know, we do that for New York mm -hmm. because we have the infrastructure here. And so now at conference, we just, we need to cut the secretary general or we need to cut some of those high level officials and they want to see their clip online and embeddable on demand. Of course they do. Immediately. Straight away. Yeah, yeah, and I get it. you're not, there's no stop, right? You're still I see. streaming. Yes. For Tell them we'll work hours. as fast as the UN. <laughs> We'll get it done as fast as the UN. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you know, so we have to then look for other services or try to have redundancy and you know, try to pull out cards or try to stop a stream or something like this, um, which isn't always great. You mm. know, just be able to, you know, especially since the redundancy is costly for us, yep. we don't have a budget. Um, that so sometimes we're going and recovering with no redundancy. It's like if, oh, this, wow. if this encoder goes down, we've lost the language. Right. Um, and so we have, we're, you know, we try to find other ways of like, okay, we're we're gonna sort of grab that that uh, uh, playback URL. Yep. Right, yep. That, yep. That, that the player would normally consume, feed it into another cloud service, and use them to cut, as opposed to just doing it. So we've been talking on how to solve some of this, but those are kind of our two mm -hmm. big challenges when we are operating, um, sort of, all, you know, as we go to conferences with just two people. Yeah. I think in, in this type of solution, there's a lot of challenges. At least the biggest headache we have is typically bandwidth. Oh, is, well, that's yeah, always a, yeah. That's a given. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, and, and you, you, you mentioned redundancy. We put a lot of effort into redundancy. You have to because if your primary fails, especially if you're if you're at a at home type of model where you're doing all your production from a remote location, is that, most of the work that you do reoccurring at a location, right? It's, it, it's very different when you're turning up one time somewhere. Right. Right. You know, I mean, like we show up. Like so, for instance, we just did, you know we we actually did a couple of big conferences, but like the, the most recent one I covered was in was in Morocco. They literally set up the conference center from nothing. They built mm. tents. Oh, wow. Built infrastructure, whatever. It's the government of Morocco that is sponsoring it. Usually, it's the the case the government is the one asking us to come, and they don't give us network redundancy. They're like, this is our right. This is the network we're going to provide you, and you know, uh, we will ask for you know dedicated parts of that bandwidth, the seg segment, like nobody else is on our, but always, always on that first day, yeah. we'll find. Somebody hacked into something, and the media <laughs> is now on our network. Uh, you know, and it's, so and it's difficult, but yeah. I mean that's a whole other. Happy hour yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I would say whether it's an on-site production solution or a video over IP solution, whether we're backhauling feeds back into a control room or doing it all on-site, redundancy plays. Like we're we're fitting out. It's, it's usually on bandwidth. Whether or not we can get that stable feed back to a control room or get it straight from our coders out to whatever the platform is. I mean that's that's why we you know we, we lean on cellular, right? We use yeah. Ethernet, but we can also lean on some cellular connectivity or Wi-Fi connectivity. You, you take as many different connections as you can yeah. and, and pray to the gods of streaming and gets there, <laughs> right? Yeah, I think that discussion of redundancy comes immediately after you identify what your primary is. It's we're going to go this way and then, all right, let's talk about it. We're going to bring a cellular bonded cell device. Yeah. We're going to go some other device. I mean, I've, got, I've got Live Nation. They take they use our bonded gear, but instead of using one of the, they, they actually take two Ethernets. They, 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 they call in two providers to give them two Ethernet connections in case one. I mean, that's, that's really spoiled. But. <laughs> yeah. no, we only got redundancy when, because it was the king that was speaking when we went down. Suddenly it was like, oh, now you have it. Okay. <laughs> you mean Elvis is alive? <laughs> well, no, it's good. We, we put redundancies in place. Not, <laughs> we put redundancies in place not just for our peace of mind, but. Uh, for a client too, and our client's not in our space. They don't know what we're doing, but just yeah. to know that, or if you're going to set up your shop at a completely different location from where we're going to be, right. you have to make sure that it's going to work, and you have to explain to us in the most 
you know, simplest of terms that how this is going to work. So we put a lot of, we have to put a lot of attention towards that. I think it's a big, big part of how you solve your, your remote production or at home production. Do we have any questions? There's got to be questions out there. No questions? I think we're getting kind of wrapped up here. So let's just do final thoughts from everyone here. Um, Mark, we'll start with you. Anything else you want to just finally say? <coughs> no, I, it's, it's interesting you say about, you know, live production is just one of those things where you can't, you know, planning everything that goes into it, the training and stuff, there's still always something, isn't there, that, uh, that goes wrong, you know, quite often. We just did an event for a Comcast out of Florida uh, on Monday for their CEO town hall and everything was going smoothly until it didn't and then you know, <laughs> and then it goes back again but it's just you know it's just in the in the remote production and you know pajama based you know amateur you've always got to sort of over plan for that situation over plan for the for the failovers and the redundancies and something breaking and always you know have that have that plan b c and d ready to go because that's the joy of life John. It's been interesting, you know, hearing the different challenges that we have. I think that, uh, from what I'm realizing, you know, we have to work uh, on redundancy. You know, that's something that we have to implement more audio channels. We have to continue to develop in the cloud, and, and it'll be interesting to see where we are this time next year. I think it'll be, a, you know, I, I I I look at our friend over there. Uh, who's from B and H, and I, I say, I wonder how their world is going to change in the next five years. He's not listening. <laughs> he's, he's browsing. <laughs> he's, he's probably looking on Amazon for an encoder. <laughs> <laughs> as long as their shipping times remain the same, I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> now just go to B and H. <laughs> Megan? And I think it'll be interesting as, you know, things do move more towards the cloud and other parts of the production world. And as we've been in the cloud, we're now starting to find that there are different use cases. So instead of just bringing in live video, manipulating it and publishing it or sending it out, um, you're, we're finding that folks, you know, technology is coming out where you can do facial recognition. You've got clients that are saying, what if we did ad markers in that live feed as it was coming in? So you're able to change the traditional roles. So you don't just have an editor that does what an editor's done for X amount of years. Like you have new roles that are being put into this place of the ecosystem. And all of that's possible because it's all cloud-based and you can just enable those different functions. Again, it can be part of that single cloud-based solution, but really it's opening it up to the, you know, to the whole world who you might have a special person, special company that does that one piece of facial recognition. Um, so it just, it creates a lot more of a, I would say, the line between digital and broadcast has completely been erased, at least where we are and where we're sitting in the ecosystem. But it allows you to open that up and you have more capability. So it's just a really exciting time. We're talking to partners that we never knew were going to be partners because people are wanting to do different things. I heard a great, just a, a great statistic the other day. There are more subscribers to Hulu and um, Netflix than there are cable subscribers. I thought that that was an interesting change in the industry. Mm. So IP is here. <laughs> well, I think it's been a great discussion. I want to thank uh, Megan, John, and, and Mark. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>